the Super Media Bros Podcast is a founding member of the Odd Pods Media Network. The World Wrestling Federation proudly presents WrestleMania! Rick Flair defends the title against the number one contender, the Macho Man, Randy Savage. The maniacal Sid Justice goes one-on-one with the immortal Paul Hogan in what could prove to be Hulk Hogan's farewell match. It's a double main event. It's WrestleMania! Welcome to Indianapolis, Indiana! Welcome to the Hoosier Dome! Welcome to WrestleMania 8! Super Media Bros. How the hell are you going to load the front half of your card up with some of the better matches and then the back half of it is just meh? Obviously, you can't predetermine how a concept is going to play out, but I feel like you could have shuffled a lot of these. Welcome to episode 220 of the Super Media Bros podcast. I'm Richie. I'm Devin. And we're here for WrestleMania 8 from 1992, the follow up to our Royal Rumble 1992 review. I got to say, as a kid, Watching this, I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, WrestleMania, uh, Shawn Michaels, The Undertaker, Bret Hart, Jake Roberts, Roddy Piper, Randy Savage, Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan. And now I'm watching this 30 years after the fact, and I'm going, Shawn Michaels, Undertaker, Bret Hart, Randy Savage, fuck the rest of this pay-per-view. Piper? We got oh, Piper. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But what, what I'm saying is like, my my guys whenever i yeah, was little yeah so i was like eh, fuck this pay-per-view but not so much fuck this pay-per-view it's so crazy because like the better matches are early in the fucking card so the like we're just gonna jump into it okay so like the dark match was the bushwhackers and the beverly brothers we we saw that at royal rumble okay we already know how this is gonna end luke and butch win and 10 minutes flat. I'm happy we didn't watch this match. I'm happy that it never aired on the fucking network. You know what's crazy? You said 10 minutes flat. I checked this whenever we were going through our notes and everything. You're not exaggerating. It is 10 minutes on I, the dot. I know. <laughs> like, it's sad. <laughs> what the fuck? How, how? Like, why? I just want to know how you get 10 minutes out of a Bushwhackers match. That too. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's so dumb and then the actual opening match is Shawn Michaels with Sherry which this is not his debut as the Heartbreak Kid but this is his first big Wrestlemania match as the Heartbreak Kid it's so funny because I was wearing a Wrestlemania t-shirt the other day to work because uh, it was a Sunday so we could do free dress right and it was the uh, Mania shirt with uh, Stone Cold and Shawn Michaels Ah, Mania 14. Yes. And uh, we were just BSing and everything. And, I, and they were like, so when did Sean actually come out as the Heartbreak Kid? And I was like, I actually don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. It had to have been in the 90s. This kind of gives us a give or take estimate. Well, here's the thing. The question that you posed on the Rumble 92 review where we were like, okay, did he attack Janetti before or after the Rumble? It was definitely before the Rumble. Yeah. So that was really the uh, incarnation of the Heartbreak Kid. But after the Rumble and up to this match, this was like, okay, you're Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels now. This is WrestleMania. 
We're going to have you wrestle Marty Jannetty. Oh, wait, nope, sorry. We're not going to have you wrestle Jannetty because he is going to be on house arrest until October of this year. So you're going to... Damn cocaine. I'm telling you, man. So he's going to wrestle Tito Santana. Who looked just like Los Matadores. I'm telling you. Well, his name was El Matador Tito Santana whenever this was happening. Okay, so I guess they kind of... I guess that tag team was actually a reference to it, but it was still kind of weird. Right. It's also very weird that you had two Puerto Ricans portraying Mexican matadors. Yeah. But, um, it's Vince for you. Exactly. And, and I will say this right now, as you know, as everybody else out there knows that grew up in this era, Bobby Heenan and the Gorilla Monsoon, I think probably had the best year as a commentary team in 1992, bar none, because they were just on fire at the Rumble. And on this one, it was no exception. Like, these two sons of bitches were just spitting hot fire the whole fucking time. Now, it's, it's some of the references are absolutely fucking dated. Um, yeah. Like, there are three instances in this match where, where Tito flies and hits Sean with either, like, a drop kick, a forearm, or a shoulder tackle. At one point, Bobby just interjects, oh, that's the flying jalapeno, or that's the flying burrito. And then he hits a forearm on Sean, and then Gorilla Monsoon says something... I really couldn't tell you what he says. I know that it is Spanish, whatever it is. And then fucking without missing a beat again, Bobby is like, what, what did you say? Extra hot paste picante? Like, <laughs> God bruh, damn. I know. I'm just like, God, it's, it, it's funny, but it's not. But it's, it's Heenan. So you kind of expect it from him. Yeah, that's the thing. It, it's so weird because it's like, I want to be uncomfortable, but you're a heel doing your job. It's, correct. It's really weird. Correct. I'm conflicted here. Uh, Sean puts on a pretty good show because again, okay, it's Tito Santana. Uh, he's obviously a legend. And at this point he had been in the company very seasoned for a long time. Sean can have a good match with just about anybody he gets in the ring with. Except for Hulk Hogan. Exactly. This match ends at 10 minutes and 38 seconds with a, just a weird over the top rope pinfall. Like Sean comes back in the ring and Tito trips and Sean just no, no leg hook falls flat on him and gets the pin. It was really lackluster. The fact that Sean was still using the uh, teardrop suplex as a finisher, and he had hit Tito, I think, with two super kicks in this match. And I think even then, as a child, I was like, why would you use a fucking side suplex as your finisher? Like, that kick was cool. Yeah. See, and that, that's what threw me off, because at the time, I, I didn't realize that super kick wasn't his finisher. So whenever I was watching it for the first time, I was like, the fuck i know he kicks him and you're just like all right pin him uh, what the fuck are you doing <laughs> why 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 what, what are you doing why you why you did this yeah like i didn't i didn't understand it but you're right teardrop suplex okay bro look how they time travel massacred our boy <laughs> well that's the thing too is you got to think about it like as in kayfabe, did he practice his super kick and perfect it? Or was like, he just didn't reach his ultimate power with it? Like, what's the deal? What, what is the difference between that super kick and the one that he used in later years? He didn't tune up the band first. Ah, gotcha. He didn't slap his leg hard enough. That's right. Because he was still using it. They even called it a crescent kick. Like, that's really what it's called as a side crescent kick. Because Marty and Sean used to do it. But Sean is like, I'm going to take it and run with it. But anyway, yeah, it was a, it was a great opening match. And then it jumps right into The Undertaker versus Jake Roberts. Now, this is what I'm talking about when I say the front half of this pay-per-view, okay? This is the second victim of The Undertaker's streak. Fun fact. I'm going to drop a lot of these fun facts. Jake Roberts almost walked on this pay-per-view. Why? He held Vince McMahon up. Oh. He was like, I want out of my contract, and if you don't release me from my contract, I'm going to walk off of this fucking pay-per-view. And he got his wish. Because he knew he was losing anyway. It wasn't like he was going over. Yeah. So he comes out and you can tell he's, he's not like it's different Jake. Like, you know, how you look at Jake from like the late 80s and he's he's still got that, you know, trust me, that real fucking just mm -hmm. dead eye, intimidating, cold promo. Jake Roberts is one of the best promo guys that has ever done it in the business. He made you listen. He is the embodiment of. Keep your mouth shut and carry a big stick. Or a snake. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, true. Like he would sit there and be real calm and tactical. Yeah. Uh, that, that's how I would describe it. Yeah. Almost methodical. Very much. 
and the build of the match was really cool. Like uh, on the funeral parlor, he locks the taker's uh, hand into a coffin and beats the shit out of him with a chair. DDT's Paul Bearer. Such a good DDT. Uh, it's still the best DDT in the business, in my opinion. It always has been and it always will be. Nobody threw it down like he did. But the match only lasts about six and a half minutes, okay? It's like six minutes, 36 seconds, and that is so... You know what it is, dude? It's one of those instances where everybody loved working with Jake because they often described it as, well, working with Jake is basically having a night off because he was such an easy, safe worker. And then you also think, and, and this is my age speaking because I wasn't alive for this m- match. But I think of The Undertaker at WrestleMania, and I'm thinking of him versus Sean, him versus Triple H, him versus Brock. You know, like I'm thinking of these long winded matches that are like 20 to 30 minutes. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, I guess Jake booked this. This is weird to think about. Yeah, because I mean, this is still back when Taker was doing that slow ass yeah. shit. Like, I think he had like a few tattoos on his left forearm. He was almost bare armed completely. Which, that's also weird to think about. But, to to be fair, it's also weird to think about his first victory at WrestleMania being won in a DQ, so there's that. Yeah, I mean, Taker's first victim was Snuka, and then it moves on to Roberts, okay? Now, I'm not really critical of the times considering Taker was a brand new character-ish, and they were still figuring out the tombstone. Like, even two years after his debut, they're still figuring the fucking tombstone out. Well, it's pretty complicated, really. Yeah, well, at the time, I'm sure. But like, yeah. okay, look, he he delivers probably the worst looking tombstone ever on the outside <laughs> of the ring. Jake's fucking head is probably like a foot above the mat. The, the camera's right on it. I think that's what really did it. The if they issues. Yeah, like if they would have shown the camera where it was like maybe just past the apron where you didn't see him hit, it would have been completely believable. But you zoomed in on him and Gorilla, Tombstone City. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm I'm seven when I see this, okay? Damn you old as fuck. I know, but I'm sitting there and I'm going, he, he didn't even, he didn't even touch. Is he just old? <laughs> like, you know, I'm sitting there going, like, I know Jake the snake, but bro, is he old now? Is he like, what the fuck? <laughs> he, and Taker done took two DDTs and kicked or set up or whatever the fuck. I'm like, why didn't he cover him? He's fucking with him. And he sits up and he's like, well, I guess I'm gonna go take this half ass tombstone outside since I'm walking out of the company anyway. Uh, Jake, Gets tombstone on the outside, rolls back in, gets pinned. And that is literally the last you see of Jake Roberts for four years. That's the first of many wrestlers that walk out of this company this year. So keep your tally score handy, okay? Okay. Next up is Brett versus Piper for the IC title. One of the matches of the night. A fun factoid about this. Piper leaves the company not long after this match happens. There's also another factoid where Bret Hart actually does a blade job in this match and there's a no blood policy at this point in the wwf okay they got away with it because brett bladed right above his eyebrow in a spot where piper sucker punches him okay and brett sold it so realistically they even went backstage after the match happened and piper was feigning concern for brett and he's like i'm really sorry dude i didn't mean to get you that hard you know i hope there's no hard feelings and brett's like no no it's okay it happens blah 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 they were so 100 percent convincing that the boys and vince bought it hook line and sinker they got away with a fucking bloody match on pay-per-view which was a great match and the finish was really well done too where brett counters piper's finishing move the sleeper with that turnbuckle kick pin like they did at um survivor series with austin Bro, I just heard that story, and all I can think about is leave it to fucking Brett and Roddy Piper. Exactly, and you wonder why they were two of the best to ever do the fucking thing. Well, that's the thing. You and I were talking about it earlier with Brett. He, Brett always made things convincing. You know, little things like the way he would hook the Russian leg sweep, or the way that he would do like a little kick with a suplex to make the momentum. Uh... That one time, I forget the match. I believe it was WCW, but I could be wrong. Uh, But I remember he got rolled up. And whenever he kicked out after the three, he goes, fuck. WrestleMania 10 versus Owen Hart. Was it? Okay. Yes. Bro, it was. You know what? You're right. Now that you say it, I do remember it being with Owen. Okay. Dude, little moments like that that make you believe that this is a genuine combat sport. Again, Brett 
did not earn the nickname the excellence of execution for nothing. He has earned every fucking nickname that he has. He really has. And this was a great match. It was like 13 minutes, 51 seconds. Brett won with that pinfall, won the Intercontinental strap back. And they made it look like they were beating the dog shit out of each other at one point. They really did. (laughs) The fucking shit was so stiff. Right? Now, here's 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 where the whole, like, reality check comes in, okay? Think about the three matches I just spouted. We both have just spouted. You've got Brett, Sean, and The Undertaker, arguably three of the greatest superstars in the history of this company. Wrestling, three of the biggest legends in the history of this company. Jake Roberts, Tito Santana, and Piper. We're going to go to a fucking eight-man tag team match where it's literally like, let's throw these assholes together and see if we can just get them a payoff. It's the big boss man, Virgil, Sergeant Slaughter, and Jim Duggan. Yeah, I re- that's really the fucking team they threw together. Mm-hmm. Versus the Nasty Boys, the Repo Man, and the Mountie. First and motherfucking foremost, how the fuck was Virgil the one that made the pin? Yeah, I'm just going to get right to it. Six minutes, 33 seconds in, Virgil gets the pinfall. And that I'm glad you brought up the runtime to this monstrosity. Uh, second of all, how in the fuck was there less time in the match per person? It was less than one minute per person. Exactly. Uh, third of all, why was this here? Fourth of all, that promo? I was watching that promo and I was like, y'all yeah, motherfuckers are really getting paid to spout off this shit, ain't y'all? So much cocaine. Dude, I'm I, telling you. I was staring into their eyes, trying to locate their pupils. <laughs> <laughs> That popped me. <laughs> them shits were so big, I couldn't even find them. Like, they had no iris. Oh, no. Speaking of cocaine-fueled promos, I forgot to bring up the fucking Legion of Doom promo because Hog just came back from his own suspension. I mean, that was a promo, or was that gibberish? Both. Because I even have, like, the timestamp. dude. It starts at 19 minutes and 52 seconds in, and it ends at 24.58. And th- I swear to God, this is how the fucking promo goes. They co- like Paul Ellering comes out with them. Paul rambles about God knows what. Tell him, Animal. Then Animal just rambles on yelling because you got to remember, this is the fucking Road Warriors. They, they just yelled during their promos. Yeah. Tell him, Hawk. Well, <laughs> tell him, Paul. Oh, uh, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Tell him, Animal. I'm like, I swear to God, it was just a bunch of gibberish ass yelling. And then Animal would keep cutting people off and taking over the goddamn microphone. <laughs> and it just, it just ends. It's just, why are they there wasting five minutes that could have been divided between two other matches? And of all things, during that tag match we were mentioning just a while ago, Ray Combs from Family Feud opened this segment and introduced the match, but mostly introduced the villains with some cut downs. And I swear to God, that man had to have said the word survey 50 fucking times. And I think that was like one of the celebrity appearances because Reba McIntyre or Reba McIntyre from some dumb shit on YouTube. <laughs> it reminds me of fucking uh, rebel from AEW. How the fuck are you going to butcher somebody's name? That was pronounced on the program and i know those motherfuckers heard it too because the whole fucking ring was mic'd the shit up oh my god i forgot look i'm glad you brought that up i forgot how fucking hardcore mic- it was on par with wrestlemania 12 dude you remember how mic'd that yeah, fucking canvas was, was man jesus christ you could hear a mouse fart in that ring <laughs> it was so fucked like you could hear audible calls being made in the ring during this i swear to god now is that where th- what those little yellow dots surrounding the ring was? Or was that just part of the actual curtain? Oh, on the apron? Yeah. Supposed to... Okay, if I'm not mistaken, those were actually magnetic. Okay. To kind of help it stick. Because whenever like I was string, watching yeah. it, I thought those were mics. They mic under the ring. That's what I thought would have been smart. There's, but... there's a mic in each corner, and then there's a mic, mm-hmm. one or two mics in the center of the ring. Okay. So... Moving from that eight man tag, which the boss man and them won, fuck them, to Randy Savage versus Ric Flair for the WWF championship. I say this with the utmost respect to both of these competitors. Great match, but I'm sorry. Once you've seen a Flair versus Savage match, you've probably seen them all. Here's the other factoid 
Ric Flair and Savage also decided to get some color in this match with a blade job. Yeah, whenever you brought up uh, bread in them, I was like, that's fascinating. No blood policy. All right. mm. Yeah, he, are you ready for this fucking uh, Ric Flair spaghetti sauce head story? Oh, of course. Okay, so the spot where Savage comes off the top rope and knocks him into the guardrail. And it's obvious, you and I, and anybody out there that sees a Ric Flair match where he bleeds can spot it clear as day. That is one critique I have of Ric Flair, and you don't hear those words often, but my critique of Ric Flair, he's not the smoothest blader. No, and it looks like he sliced himself three times. On camera, obviously. Vince McMahon fined him several thousands of dollars for this. He, I think he even like tried to lie about it at first, and that's what pissed him <laughs> off. And McMahon was just like, fuck you, and he fined him a shitload of money. And a lot of people don't realize this either, but this was around the time Savage started wearing like the full vest gear in the ring and shit. Yeah. A big reason he was doing that is because he, when he quit doing steroids, his muscle mass went down, so he was actually hiding the fact that he got smaller. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And again, this is around the time of the steroid scandal that happened with Vince McMahon from 92 to 93. So there was him doing that just to kind of hide that he was shrinking a little bit. Now, Savage won this match, and it was a really good match. There was a lot of story going into it. It was very emotional. The crowd was so heavily invested. This is probably in no certain order when I say one of the matches of the night, one of the matches of the night. And the original main event was actually supposed to be Hogan versus Flair for the championship, but Hogan didn't want to lose to Flair, and he was leaving the company after this for a little while for a sabbatical. What a fucking dick. Yeah, so they changed it up to where they were just going to follow the story from the Rumble with Sid and Hogan, and then they were going to have this whole storyline where Flair and Mr. Perfect have these uh, photos of Miss Elizabeth they were threatening to just plaster everywhere. Even more shitty is in real life, Elizabeth and Randy were going through a fucking divorce during this storyline. Yeah, I remember that now. Okay. Yeah. And like, was, I remember reading about it anyway. I wasn't alive yet. Yeah. But. And it was off camera, but I mean, it, it just fizzled out. This was the last major appearance on a pay per view at the WWF that Elizabeth made. Wow. Savage's second WWF championship run. He only had two world title runs in the company. I Holy feel like he shit. should have had more. Well, it's one of those things, kind of like with Taker, where in your mind, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. He held the belt like, a dozen times. No, he fucking didn't. He literally had God, I think, years between his first and second championship reign. And Taker, his last reign was what, 2008, if I had to guess? Think so. Yeah. Give or take, it was something like that. That sounds about right. Right. And then you go from this match, okay? And it was heavily contested, very good. A lot of great selling of the knee from Savage. And of course, you know, Flair being. The dirtiest player in the game tried everything he could to cheat to win. Savage actually won with a handful of trunks, and the post match interview was fucking hilarious as shit. Like Flair running to the back, all coked out looking, <laughs> talking about how he's still going to go fucking like, I don't even remember if he said Space Mountain during this one because he says it every time. But they're bitching and moaning. Heenan has come down from the commentary booth to bitch about it. He's like, I saw he had a handful of trunks. This is bullshit. And he's just going off him. Savage is all coked out, and he's like giving Elizabeth the fucking title. He's like, this is for you. Flair only got a piece of you. And he just starts ripping his shirt. He's like, you can have all of me. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just like fucking crazy eyed. Like, there's no people on this motherfucker. <laughs> no. Sweating and shit. <laughs> That's when you know it's bad. Randy Savage died for our Slims. <laughs> God damn it. He died for our Slim Chips. <laughs> But no, seriously, it was just, ugh. you go from that match to Rick the Model Martel versus Tatanka for a four minute and 33 second forgettable fucking match. Yeah. I, I don't care about this. I, match. I watched it and I forgot that it even happened. Yep. Tatanka wins. Devin, the summer sun is just around the corner and you know what that means. Musty ball sack. Yeah, dude. The water gets warmer. The skin gets darker. And the hair gets pubier? It really does. Can we fix that? Yes, we can, because our friends at Manscaped are here to make that summer bod pop with their signature lawnmower 4.0. A four? That's right, dude. 
Join the 4 million men worldwide that trust Manscaped and get ready for hot boy summer by going to manscaped.com and getting 20% off plus free shipping with our code SUPER. Guys, let's be real. Nobody likes the hairy guy at the beach rave, and I feel personally attacked by this. So it's time to bundle up with the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, the Performance Boxer Briefs, and their Shed Travel Bag to hold your goodies. That's six items, dude! I'm telling you! First off, the Performance Package 4.0 includes the Lawnmower 4.0. This trimmer was designed with summer intentions in mind. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. It also has a 7000 RPM motor, a new multifunction on and off switch that can engage a travel lock, and it gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on or off when you need a more precise shave. Did you know it's waterproof? I do now. That's right, it's both pool and beach party approved. Manscaped even has you covered with their signature crop mop ball wipes for any, uh, dare I say, spontaneous decisions? Well, uh, now that you mention it. Want to take it up a notch, man? Yeah. Well, Manscaped's Shears 2.0 is an all-encompassing nail kit to tackle those gross sandal nails you might acquire. Seal the deal with Manscaped's liquid formulations. Before you head outside, use the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant to keep you on your game in the heat. For any on-the-go ball sweats, freshen up with Manscaped's Crop Reviver and hop back into the mix with confidence. Manscaped is even throwing two free gifts into the Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Premium Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort and boxers to another level. Get 20% off plus free shipping with our code SUPER at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with our code SUPER at manscaped.com. It's time to trim off those spring flowers this summer and give your beach balls a shine with Manscaped. Hey, it's Dalton. And Sam. We want to tell you about our podcast called Big Ten Plus Four. Are you a college football fan who doesn't want to always be talking about the SEC? Are you a college basketball fan who's tired of hearing how the Big Ten doesn't win in the big dance? Then we're the show for you. Check us out each week on the Odd Pods Media Network. We bring you college sports with a Big Ten flavor. Big Ten Plus Four. College sports with Midwest perspective. Blue collar and blue blood. Tag team title match. Money Incorporated, who are the champions versus the natural disasters. Okay, this should have been a great match. And for all intents and purposes, it was pretty well contested. Here's my problem. They liked to do the whole I'm taking the ball and going home finish with a lot of the heel champions back then. Around eight minutes and 28 seconds, Ted and Erwin R. Scheister just grab their belts and fucking leave. And it's a count out win at eight minutes and 38 seconds. I'm obviously stating the 10 second count <laughs> from the 28 second to the 38 second mark. It, it, I hate saying it like this. It, it should have been more memorable. It's just not. There's, and then there's two more matches on this card, mind you. After this is Owen Hart versus Skinner, and it gets a minute and 36 seconds. Owen, Again, I forgot. I'm telling you, dude, Owen Hart comes to the ring in his high energy gear. Does a backflip off the top rope. He turns around, and you remember Skinner. I don't know what really his gimmick was. He was just this weird, creepy fucker with a beard. You want to know what's fucking wild, though? Hmm. Of all the goddamn motherfuckers that have died already from this era, Skinner's still around. Yeah. That motherfucker is 70. I'm telling you. And has been retired for over 20 years. The fucker would chew dip in his mouth during his matches. And <laughs> he fucking spat in Owen's face yeah. to the point. Fucking Alex, when we were watching together, they saw that happen and audibly went <laughs> like fucking gagged. Yeah. Because I, even I did. It's fucking gross. Even if even if that portion of it was, you know, gimmicked or whatever, it's disgusting because Owen basically wrestles with a face full of shit the, for, the, for the minute and a half he's in the ring. Well, that's like with that, uh, Benoit, he would hawk that fucking loogie on people. Oh, dude, what's worse, that or when fucking when fucking Brett spit in Shawn Michaels' face at SummerSlam '97? Is that oh. loogie just dangling off his fucking nose and his mouth? Ugh. 
What always got me as a kid, though, and even to this day, I can't hawk a loogie on command. Like, it's got to have built up. Some oomph. <laughs> like, like, I have to actually be sick for it. So I'm seeing that. I'm like, are you guys wrestling sick 24-7? Like, are you, are you, are you just hoping on a whim for the storyline that you're just ill? <laughs> no, dude, that, that shit dries up after a while. It's bad. Dude, I don't understand how they fucking do it. I know. But then you go from Owen Hart defeating Skinner to the main, the, which was a double main event, mind you. We got the, the first main event was the, was the fucking fifth match in on the card. Six if you count the dark match. Hulk Hogan versus Sid Justice. Which this was built up as Hogan's possible farewell match because on camera, you know, it was just like, oh, Sid Justice is going to end Hulkamania. Vince is even doing like segments with Hogan being like, oh, well, if this truly is indeed the last time we see Hulk Hogan in the ring, thank you for all the years. Thank you for the friendship and thank you for Hulkamania and all this other shit. They're really piling it on in real life. Hogan is leaving after this match happens. No matter what he's, he's fucking gone. He's going to do some movies. He's going to just take, take some time away. So this match happens and oh boy, uh, 12 minutes, 26 seconds. Uh, Hogan wins by DQ, which this was a typical Hogan big man match. But there are some things about this I want to talk about. Okay. And it's not even the fucking match itself, because like I said, it's Hogan and Sid. It is what it is. This is probably the most Hulk Hogan Hulkamania intro walk to the ring you've ever seen in your entire fucking life. This man across uh, from me's mouth was just a gape the whole time. Like asking me, did, did this get overdubbed? And I was like, no, I had this on VHS. D this was what happened. Bruh. They fucking played his music while they had a little scuffle before the match for a fucking minute and a half until he ripped his shirt off. And then did like the little like ear thing to the crowd. And then the music ended. I was like, they, they had a full blown fight. I thought the match already started. Not, no, dude. It's like Hogan's like this match don't start till the shirt comes off, brother. Bruh. So by technicality, his entrance included the walkway, a beat down, the pose, the shirt ripping. More posing, hulking up, and then more posing, <laughs> and then the entrance ended. Oh, 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 but that's not all, okay? Because then you have a match that was Sid versus Hulk Hogan, so kind of like with Rick and Savage, you know, you, you've seen it once, you've seen it a billion times, but still entertaining nonetheless, but that's not all. First, the motherfucking foremost, uh, Papa Shanga missed his cue. It's plain as day. Oh, he missed it by a fucking mile. Like, because that's probably how long the walkway to the ring is. is oh, a it fucking definitely mile. was. You can tell because, as per usual, Ultimate Warrior finally made it. <laughs> Breaking wanna, a bead, sweating. Uh, oh, God damn it. Dude. And then uh, you want to talk about Hulk Hogan's uh, posing and everything. Him and Warrior had about. 20 minutes of fucking posing, I swear on everything. I want to talk about that finish, though, because, look, he was supposed to come to the ring to cause the DQ. There's a multitude of fuckery happening here, okay? Hogan hits the leg drop. By this point, Shango should have been to the ring and causing the breakup of the pinfall for the disqualification. He was nowhere to be seen, so Sid had to kick out of the leg drop. <laughs> Nobody has kicked out of the atomic leg drop. So it, by and large, just shits on the finisher. Harvey Whippleman had to jump in the ring and then Ho he didn't even lay a hand on Hogan. Hogan gets up and grabs him and then that causes the DQ. But I'm laughing so hard at this because when they cut back to the entrance, Papa Shango has this half walk, half bewildered, I'm lost as fuck just look about him. I guess he didn't know like, do I, do I keep going even though I'm late or is it too late? Is it weird yeah. now? Yeah, he made it awkward, but it's even funnier because Gorilla Monsoon is still just calling it like it's supposed to happen there. What's Papa Shango doing here? <laughs> just going with it, dude. And then he finally Bless makes it. Heart. I know, man. I loved Gorilla and Bobby so much. Look, he gets to the fucking ring and then they, they start to the beat down on Hogan. Which when they show recaps of this in years later on like, you know, video packages, they completely omit 
the fuckery part. And then just cut to Shango running in and beating his ass with Sid. Then it cuts to the warrior who had the quickest single mile dash to the ring ever in history. And I just still laugh my ass off when he runs in there and he's just shaking the ropes and Sid hits him with the chair and he's just like, no, no, and he hits him again. And no, and he's fucking just shaking. He didn't even let go. He was just like spazzing. He was probably having a muscle spasm. Like, I wonder if that's why he held the robes. Like, his muscles were just twitching. He's like, I gotta fucking, fucking hang on to your fucking life. No, nah, he was just fucking coked out like the rest of them. I know, dude. Jesus, fuck, though. He, <laughs> he fucking, dude, I bet. Oh, God damn it, dude. I'm serious when I say that. I bet Jim Helwig was a furious masturbator. Oh, dude. You know that man was hitting him with the two-hand twisty combo at fucking 400 strokes per minute. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, the beat down stops. And like you said, they close line him out of the ring and Hulk Hogan's music hits and they proceed to stand there until they run out of the pyro budget for the night. Yeah, that shit damn near looked like a fucking Cody Rhodes entrance. A little bit. I also forgot to mention uh, the Lex Luger interview because this is when the uh, WBF, the World Bodybuilding mm. Federation and Ico Pro was a thing. They originally had hired him to do that shit, but then he wound up wrestling a year later because that folded. And they're like, well, fuck, we got Lex Luger under contract. And the other part about this, which is going to blow your fucking mind, okay? Okay. So the attendance was like 62,167 people. They actually had to give away, if I'm remembering right, they had to give away damn near 20,000 tickets to people to fill this fucking arena up because they only really? s- they only sold about 40,000 tickets to this, dude. And this is the Hoosier Dome, which I think is the RCA Dome now. It's where the uh, Indianapolis Colts franchise is. Yeah. So that's a big fucking place. Even on camera back oh, in 92. It, it looked huge. It was. And dude, the fact that they had to give away 20,000 tickets for, for this pay-per-view. You know what I'm wondering, though? Have they ever considered, like, donating to maybe, like, a Big Brothers, Big Sisters or something like that for kids that would come in and be very loud and energetic? Because I feel like you always hear about, like, oh, these radio shows do the free giveaways and all that stuff. I always thought that that was weird because it's like, well, at that point, they're just going to go if they win and it's just a free ticket. So it's like, oh, yeah, I guess I'll go. Right. Why don't you give it to like kids that actually watch the fucking product? Exactly. I, I, that would have been the thing to do, considering they were trying to bring kids to the shows at, the, at this time. Not only that, but we know that WWE, even back then, they love jerking themselves off with that shit. Oh, yeah. Patting themselves on the back real fucking hard, dude. Yeah. Like we gave all these kids the day of their dreams. So I, I feel like that should definitely be looked into. Yeah. Now, here's some of the factoids about the people leaving, okay? So, for those of you keeping score at home, like, and, and this is literally as of the year of 92. It's, it's Some of these are weeks after. Like, Sid Justice left, like, three weeks after this. Quit completely during a fucking house show run. <laughs> so, Jake Roberts is gone. Roddy Piper is gone. Sid Justice is gone. Hogan's gone. That's four. That's four guys in some of the biggest matches on the card that went bye-bye. By the end of 92, Ultimate Warrior had left. Flair leaves in 1993, like in February or some shit like that. And holy fuck, dude, it's just, it's insane to think about that at WrestleMania 12, four years later, three of the people that left this company after this came back. Piper, Roberts, and Warrior. That's so weird. Like, just thinking about your heaviest hitters leaving. Probably scrambling, trying to figure out what you're going to do. And then they come back. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Now, this really made room for the, quote, new generation to happen. That's true, too. Yeah. So by the time nine rolls around, which is arguably the worst WrestleMania of all time, you got Bret Hart as your world champion. Shawn Michaels is in the Intercontinental title picture. Razor Ramon has entered the company by then. In fact, Razor Ramon enters the company this year as we're covering 1992 this year. This is the year he enters the WWF. But still, the fact that, like you said, those heavy hitters just gone by. That's fucking crazy. Now, 
we realize this is kind of a quick run through, but there's really not a lot here to unpack. If you want to watch this, it's on Peacock. Highly suggest the Sean match, the Undertaker match, Bret Hart, and I mean, hell, the Savage and Flair match. Absolutely. Honestly, the Bret Hart match was one of the better WrestleMania matches, period. Yes, like, it was. Uh, regardless of the year. And nobody talks about that match enough to me. No. Uh, it, it was fucking amazing. And Brett's going to have another match that is highly regarded when we come back to 1992 in August to cover SummerSlam 1992 from mm-hmm. Wembley Stadium. Where it's the British Bulldog and Brett for yes. the IC title as the main event. Which is crazy to think that the Intercontinental title used to be held to such a high standard that at one point it was the main event match of a pay-per-view over your WWF championship. But yeah, that's all I think that I have to say about this pay-per-view. Yeah, that's about it. I mean, you can talk about like backstory and then what happened moving forward. But as far as the, the program itself, I mean, I mean, there's a couple of other like, okay, th- th- there's two things I actually do want to point out before we go that I thought was fucking crazy. I think it's a pretty well-known fact in the wrestling community that anytime Ric Flair was going to lose a big fucking match, he wore all red. Yeah. He wore all red to this. I mean, and he even fucking bladed red everywhere. So there's that, which I thought was crazy because he would wear blue for his big wins, which is again, when he got retired at 24 versus Michaels, he wore his blue gear. So nobody was really seeing that coming. Like for real, for real. He had to have done that on purpose. I'm sure he did. Yeah, like you can't convince me otherwise. And a funny thing to leave you all with before we head out of here, before Sid's match with Hogan even began, he wasn't even halfway to the ring before he was sweating like Shaquille O'Neal at the free throw line. Yeah. uh, What was his warm up? I think it was a bunch of yelling because he fucking straight up looked at, I think it was Gene Okerlund trying to interview him post-match. Shut up, you fat, stupid, bald-headed little loaf! <laughs> that is one of the funniest goddamn things I've ever heard come out of Sid's mouth. I think it's funnier because it's so, like, PG. Like, it's always the funniest ones whenever it's the non-vulgar insults. Because it's just like, how are you going to insult me like a kindergartner and you're a grown-ass man? He done called me, Gene Oakland, a short, fat, bald-headed little loaf. <laughs> It's like seven adjectives in one <laughs> clean sweep. <laughs> Fucking asshole. I know. <laughs> he was so mad. <laughs> but yeah, that that's WrestleMania 8 from 1992. Uh, son of a bitch. Yeah, check it out on Peacock. We'll be back with another uh, pay-per-view in August of 92, which we have more pay-per-views to review before we get there. But as far as our World Wrestling Federation year of 92 continuing, that's the one. Visit SuperMediaBrosPodcast.com for past, present, and future episodes. Check out all the other shows on the Odd Pods Media Network by visiting OddPodsMedia.com. Somebody bought a tank top and a motherfucking koozie. Leave us a review for it. That's what I'm saying. If you have our merch, fucking wear that shit and tag us on social media. I was about to say, we'll repost it. Yeah, we will. Damn right we will. Oh, sexy ass motherfuckers. That's it. Bye. A Super Media Bros tank top so that you can beat the shit out of Sid Justice for 50 fucking minutes while your music plays and then you can rip it in half and buy a new one and do it all over again. Follow us on social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's all in the show notes below. Subscribe to us on YouTube. You know, that thing where you can click the like button, leave a comment, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, all that jazz. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or Podchaser. You can leave individual reviews on Good Pods and Podchaser. So, get on that shit. You ready to get the fuck out of here, dude? Yee. Yee. Thanks for hanging out in the World Wrestling Federation in 1992 again. That was uh, quite the time travel. This has been episode 220, WWF WrestleMania 8 from 1992. Until next time, I'm Richie. I'm Devin. Shades on. We're off.